Today is September 4th, 2018, and it is an auspicious day because 95 years ago on this date, the United States made a great leap forward in aviation history with the maiden voyage of the ZR-1, America's first American-built rigid airship. The ZR-1 was a marvel of modern technology and absolutely unique among airships in the world at the time, and it represents that brief and spectacular era when behemoths of the sky floated majestically around the world. It is history that deserves to be remembered. On a chilly night, October 19th, 1917, 11 German Zeppelins took off from their bases, planning what was one of the largest bombing raids of the era. The raid was expected to be 25 hours long, demonstrating the significant endurance advantage that airships had over aircraft at the time. The Zeppelins were meant to attack London, part of a mission to attack the British homeland in the hopes of forcing British aircraft to be redeployed away from attacking German bases and to terrify the British population. The German Zeppelin raids over London were particularly terrifying as the nearly silent airships were nearly invisible at night, and night flying was particularly dangerous for aircraft at the time. Although they were attacked by British anti-aircraft guns, they managed to drop all their bombs. 36 people were killed in the raid and 55 were injured. A single 300-pound bomb from Zeppelin L-45 fell at Glenview Road, Hither Green, London, destroying three houses and damaging many others. Five women and nine children were killed, including seven siblings of the Kingston family between the ages of three and 18. It was the last bomb dropped on London by a Zeppelin. But that night, the Allies would get their revenge. While returning to the base, the airships ran into strong headwinds and heavy fog, and in the confusion, eight of the eleven wandered over Allied territory in France. Two were destroyed by Allied aircraft, and two were attacked by French aircraft. Both were forced down. One of those, the Zeppelin L-49, was forced to land, realizing as the tracer bullets from the French spads flew by that they could not escape, and that a hit from one of those rounds would cause their hydrogen-filled airship to explode. The crew hung out a white flag, and the French pilots directed them to land near bourbon le bain in northeastern France. Before the French pilots could land, the German commander destroyed the craft's wireless. He tried to set the airship on fire, but was stopped by a local man. Twenty-one German crew were taken prisoner. But more than that, the L-49 was landed, undamaged. It was the first German airship to be captured intact. The L-49 was studied and reverse-engineered. The U.S. intended to use the design of the L-49 as the basis for the first American-built rigid airship, but to show the danger of traveling in those airships at the time, the U.S. design was influenced by the crashes of two other airships. The British had used the information garnered from the study of the L-49 to help design their own class of airship, the R-38. Initially, four airships of the class were to be built, but three of the orders were canceled as the armistice ended the war. The R-38 was also canceled while under construction due to budget constraints, but the United States expressed interest and the airship was purchased and completed. At the time, it was the largest airship in the world. The plan was to do some 50 hours of flight testing to test the airship and train its U.S. crew. On August 27, 1921, while being tested in northeast England, the structure of the airship collapsed amidships. Witnesses said both ends drooped, followed by a fire and then an explosion. 28 Britons and 16 Americans died in the crash. The L-49 was of a special design, the U-Class, called a height climber. The design had been made to maximize the ability to climb, making the Zeppelin safer from anti-aircraft fire. But that required reducing the weight by weakening the structure. The inquest over the crash of the R-38 found that the structure was not able to manage the stresses of maneuvering and had not incorporated new features of airship design that allowed a stronger structure. The U.S. took these lessons to heart. Unlike the L-49 and the R-38, the Roma was a semi-rigid airship. Rather than having a full internal structure, such airships are built around a rigid keel. The Roma was designed and built in Italy and purchased by the United States in 1921. It was, at the time, the largest semi-rigid airship in the world. But disaster struck in February of 1922. The airship's box steering system failed during a test flight and the ship swung around where it hit high-voltage wires. Filled with flammable hydrogen gas, the Roma burst into flames. 34 of the airship's crew were killed. 
And so when the first American-built rigid airship was laid down on June 24th, 1922, based very much on the German L-49, it incorporated a number of structural improvements which was supposed to help it avoid the fate of the British R-38. And to avoid the fate of the Roma, the Americans decided that they would use the rare expensive but non-flammable gas helium as the lifting gas rather than hydrogen. The construction of the airship, originally called the ZR-1, was quite a feat of engineering. It was to be 680 feet long, more than 100 feet longer than the battleship USS Texas. It was to be assembled in the newly constructed Hangar 1 at Naval Air Station Lakehurst in New Jersey. Hangar 1, at 966 feet long, was at the time the world's record holder as the single largest room in the world. The structure was made out of duralumin, a type of age-hardened aluminum alloy, and manufactured at the U.S. Naval Aircraft Factory at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. The parts were then transported by truck and rail to Lakehurst for assembly. The first ring for the structure arrived April 22, 1922, and was more than 78 feet across. Rings were connected together with longitudinal girders. Tension wires added strength and stability. Inside, there was room for 20 gas cells, which would hold the lifting gas. The gas cells were made of rubberized cotton lined with gold beater skin, which was taken from the outer membranes of the intestines of cattle, and was one of the most gas impervious materials known at the time. While helium has the advantage of not being explosive, the use of helium offered some unique challenges. For example, as an airship expends fuel for its engines, it becomes lighter, causing the airship to rise. To maintain neutral buoyancy, a hydrogen airship would simply release some hydrogen gas, as hydrogen is cheap and easy to produce. But helium was expensive and rare, too expensive to merely vent into the atmosphere. In fact, filling up the airship consumed a significant portion of the entire world's helium reserves. The ZR-1 instead had a system that condensed and collected water vapor from the engines, which counterbalanced the weight lost as the ship burned fuel. The frame was then covered with high-grade cotton fabric, laced tightly into place over the entire hull and given several coats of dope, which shrunk the material tight against the framework. The final coat was mixed with aluminum powder to provide a smooth, weather-resistant skin, which also reflected the sun's heat away from the lifting gas. The airship was launched on August 20th, 1923, which means that still... Inside the hangar, it was removed from its shorings and floating free. On September 4th, 95 years ago today, some 15,000 people watched as 420 sailors and marines walked the ZR-1 out of Hangar 1 for the first time. And using four of her six 300-horsepower, eight-cylinder Packard gasoline engines, lifted off the field with 29 people on board. It was the world's first ever flight of a helium-inflated rigid airship. The ZR-1 remained aloft for 55 minutes. The ZR-1 underwent a number of trials over the next month, flying as far as St. Louis for the 1923 St. Louis Air Races. The flight went without a hitch, but the airship was yet to be tested for its value to the fleet. The ship was christened in a ceremony on October 10th. The Secretary of the Navy, Edwin Demby's wife, Marion, did the honors, christening the ship the USS Shenandoah, named after the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia. The word Shenandoah was derived from a Native American word for the river, which some translate as beautiful daughter of the stars. The ship was commissioned the same day under the command of Navy Commander Frank McCrary. The Shenandoah met its first great challenge in January of 1924. The ship had been working on mooring with the giant Lakehurst mooring mass. The mooring mass was a technological marvel in itself at over 160 feet tall with an elevator, communication systems, electric lighting, and piping for gasoline, oil, helium, and water ballast. Once more, the crew could exit the airship via a gangway from the nose. A mooring tower offered certain advantages over a hangar and avoided the difficult process of docking. Moreover, on long trips, hangars would not always be available. The Navy had talked about using the Shenandoah for Arctic research. On such a trip, docking facilities would be unavailable and mooring towers would have to be used for resupply. But mooring was a difficult process and took quite a lot of practice and testing. On January 14th, the Weather Service issued a warning about gale force winds. Rather than dock the Shenandoah ahead of the storm, the Navy decided to leave it moored to the mooring station to test the mooring. That turned out to be a mistake. A gust of nearly 80 miles per hour struck, collapsing the top fin and rolling the ship over. That twisted the nose cone, attached the mooring tower off, and the crippled Shenandoah was off for an exciting ride. 
The forward gas cells deflated and the airship pitched forward. A crash might have destroyed the Shenandoah, but the crew jettisoned ballast and ordered the crew members aft to right the ship. The ship careened across the field, nose still down, narrowly missing the treetops. The engines were started and the crew slowly regained control, shifting ballast and fuel until the Shenandoah was righted. The damaged ship rode ahead of the storm, finishing 50 miles away in Newark. Following the storm, the ship had to be nursed back, difficult to control without a nose and with its twisted top fin. But the Shenandoah had survived the worst January storm in the area in decades. President Coolidge sent a telegram of congratulations. After repairs, the Shenandoah began testing for practical application with the Navy, demonstrating that an airship could be valuable in the scouting role. A Navy oiler, the USS Potoka, was fitted with a mooring mast and specially modified as an airship tender. In October, the Shenandoah flew across the nation, from Lakehurst to San Diego, up to Washington and back, testing newly built mooring towers. It was the first rigid airship to cross North America. In 1924, the ship was laid up for repairs and modifications. Helium was so scarce that some of Shenandoah's helium was needed to inflate the new airship USS Los Angeles. During the process, the ship's captain, Zachary Lansdowne, had 10 of the ship's automatic gas valves removed. The decision saved several hundred pounds in weight and it limited the release of expensive helium gas, but it came at a price. As an airship rises, the gas inside the gas bags expands and the pressure valves are there to release gas so that the gas bags don't expand to the point where they damage the airship's structure. By removing 10 of the Shenandoah's 18 automatic gas valve releases, Captain Lansdowne had limited the ability of the Shenandoah to gain altitude quickly, because if it rose too quickly, the gas valves that were less could not keep up with the expansion of the gas. In September, the ship left for a promotional tour of the Midwest, with a plan to visit state fairs and fly over Midwest cities. The trip was a risk. The thunderstorm season could be brutal in the Midwest. Commander Lansdowne argued that the trip should be cancelled, or at least postponed past mid-September, when the season usually subsided. But his superiors would only allow the trip to be postponed until September 3rd, when the Shenandoah was expected to make a visit to the Ohio State Fair. On September 3rd, the airship was over Ohio when it hit a storm cell. Spectators described the ship as being tossed around like a bobber, at one point nearly standing on end. Convective updrafts lifted it as fast as a thousand feet per minute, more than the remaining valve releases could handle. The Shenandoah broke in two, the aft section plummeting, killing the engineers in the section. The control car broke loose and dropped to the ground, killing the men inside, including Commander Lansdowne. Seven men in the bow managed to get enough control to release gases and free balloon to a soft landing. In all, 14 members of the Shenandoah's crew died in the accident. After the accident, many people blamed the Army and the Navy for ignoring Commander Lansdowne's warnings about the weather. Airships were really only built to be flown in good weather, and they are at particular risk over land where there can be violent updrafts. Aviator Billy Mitchell's criticism was so strong, essentially arguing that public relations had overcome safety, that he was court-martialed for his criticism and his career was ruined. But other people blamed Commander Lansdowne for the removal of the gas pressure valves. In a sorry display, spectators at the scene took away souvenirs, heedless of the aviator's deaths. The farmer upon whose land the ship had crashed charged visitors by the carload to visit the site. Today, various memorials mark the locations of the wreckage and memorialize the crash. As a result of the inquiry, the military decided to strengthen the internal structure of its remaining airships and decided to start paying more official attention to weather forecasting, but in the end, the airships just turned out to be unsafe. Of America's four rigid airships, only one, the USS Los Angeles, made it all the way to retirement. In 1933, the USS Akron was destroyed in a storm at sea and 73 people died. Two years after that, its sister ship, the USS Macon, was destroyed in another storm at sea and two people died. And two years after that, the Hindenburg exploded as it was trying to land at Naval Air Station Lakehurst. The accidents put an end to the era of the common use of rigid airships. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.